so Mike can face check Blumberg. We hear you. We hear you. Thank you so much. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to uh, welcome you to our first Student Achievement Committee meeting of the academic school year. So um, thank you so much to everyone who is here in person. And uh, in person today, we have um, Board Member Tara Waters, um, uh, Committee Member Karen Carter, Roxy Cash, Chair Mahaffey, Dr. Martin, and online we have uh, Committee Vice Chair Monika johnson Hostler, and we're also joined online by Board Attorney Jonathan Blumberg. And I expect we'll have some other folks joining us uh, for the meeting, so thank you to everyone for, for being here today. We're going to be covering two topics, the opening of school updates, which for our traditional schools. The students aren't here yet, but uh, and some students have been for in school for several weeks now for different calendars. And then we're also going to be uh, hearing a continuation of the, the letters uh, implementation and how that's going for our educators. But before we get started in the meeting, could I please entertain a motion to approve the committee minutes from June 27th? Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. We had a motion to approve by Ms. Carter and a second by Ms. Waters. And all those in favor, show a sign of aye, please. Aye. Any opposed? And I'm sorry I didn't ask for discussion. I assume we were good with that. And the motion passes, so those minutes are approved. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Drew Cook and his team. And thank you all for being here today as well. Great, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, good afternoon, Board Chair Mahaffey and uh, Committee Chair Scott, Superintendent Moore, and Board members. Uh, we are excited to kick off a new year um, of sharing and discussions 
uh, and board updates um, in your monthly student achievement committee meetings. Uh, we really can think of no better way to, to start the year um, than to share and highlight some of the great work um, that many of you have already seen that's happening in our schools. Uh, as Ms. Scott referenced, the school year opened, I believe, July 7th. And so for some of us, um, it's been in full motion now for almost six weeks. And then for the rest, um, it will be in full motion one week from today. So we're excited to share some of the highlights, um, but also some of the priorities um, uh, for the work of the district and our schools moving forward into the 22-23 school year. So we appreciate the opportunity. Um, as we look at our desired outcomes, uh, more specifically our intent for the time that we have on this topic today is to highlight some of the ongoing pre-K-12 events and activities occurring uh, with the opening of the 22-23 school year. Um, and we also want to share an overview of the prioritized strategies and practices uh, that will support what we believe will be a renewed focus on teaching, learning, and also behavioral health. Um, as we've talked about, as we continue transitioning away from emergency pandemic response and focus more of our time, attention, and efforts uh, on longer term recovery. Um, so to do that, I've got with me and beside me a great team of folks um, from our academics department, our senior directors from each of our respective levels, uh, including Eric Fitz from middle school programs, Sarita Smith from elementary programs, and a familiar face, uh, maybe even in a familiar role if you've been in your positions long enough. Um, happy to have Mr. John Williams, who is here with us in an interim capacity for senior director of high school programs. So uh, have a dynamite team of, of veteran experienced leaders and certainly look forward to sharing a little bit. I, I will present the slides um, and they will be happy to respond uh, to questions and provide additional information. We'll just try to cut down on kind of the musical presenters and I'll just run through the presentation and certainly happy to, to have them share more details uh, with anything that you might have questions about or seek more information on at the end. So to get started, um, we felt like it was appropriate to take a quick look back uh, to where we were just one year ago. And in some ways, I think uh, it feels like just yesterday and in other ways, it feels like a lifetime ago. Um, but we did want to kind of point out the, the shifting landscape um, that's occurred over the course of the past year. If you recall, this time a year ago, we were in the midst of the Delta surge months before any of us had ever heard of the term Omicron. Um, the August, if you go back and look, and we did at the August 2021 board presentation, by the same title, Opening of Schools Updates, was 82 slides long and covered anything and everything from COVID protocols and health guidelines to virtual academy uh, and a myriad of operational updates from transportation to staffing. Uh, now, some of those topics are still certainly important and relevant. Um, but the range of what we uh, want to highlight here today will be more narrow. Um, we felt like that's particularly appropriate given the setting of the Student Achievement Committee meeting. So our focus um, will be on high quality core instruction and tiered supports that are visible in classrooms every day. And also just on best practices that promote and support uh, the environments that are focused on student well-being and learning, which we want to see, of course, in every classroom and every school. So as we go to the next slide, um, you've seen this before, uh, just to kind of a, a quick recap. As we talk about that transition and that shift in focus, we wanted to quickly again reference um, this slide and the following one you've seen a few times. Um, as we rethink and reimagine and reinvent, um, our philosophy is really no different in terms of moving forward. We want to continue to meet students where they are provide them with instruction and support that they need to be successful. Uh, and we also want to continue to hold fast to our core belief that every student deserves to be challenged with meaningful, meaningful learning every single day. Uh, and as we look at the next slide to do that um, and to make that core belief a reality, especially in the post pandemic transition that we're engaging in, we'll be spending a lot of time on some of the key themes outlined in this recovery framework. Uh, which over time, as we've talked about before, as recently as last week, is likely to merge and be incorporated uh, into the new strategic plan as those goals and action steps in the revised strategic plan become more refined uh, and also concrete in the months ahead. So to get started, uh, we'll start with one of the key themes in that recovery framework we just shared, which is communication and collaboration. 
Uh, as you might imagine, there's been an incredible level of anticipation, excitement, and optimism from our staff, students, and families, probably even more so than usual, um, given the challenges of the past couple of years. Our school leaders, teachers, and staff have spent countless hours uh, going back to last winter, um, through the spring, through the summer, planning and preparing for the first day of school. As we mentioned, uh, whether that's July 7th um, or August the 29th or somewhere in between, depending on the calendar. Engagement of our staff, um, students and families is not an event. Um, it really is a practice. And to quote an excerpt from our district definition of family and community engagement, we know and understand that responsibility and commitment ensures inclusive, authentic, and accessible experiences that foster academic and social emotional success for each student. Um, so here on this slide, some examples that you see um, that bring that to life are things like rising sixth grade and freshman camps, um, after hour summer explorers and other events focused on supporting students uh, with strategies for success, things like campus tours, community and volunteer engagement opportunities uh, for those key transition years, uh, which we know and understand uh, are particularly important between fifth and sixth and eighth and ninth grades. Uh, also represented on this slide, you see other beginning of the year events such as meet the teacher nights. Um, this was a new term for an old salty high school guy like me, tea and tissues for our kindergarten parents. And I'm sure um, Ms. Sarita can explain a little bit more about that in a few minutes if, if you wish. Campus scavenger hunts uh, to help build momentum and excitement for the year ahead. Uh, and all these events are designed to connect students and families and to make, um, make those that we serve comfortable in the environment that they're moving into. Whether it's the first time they've set foot on that campus uh, or it's their fifth or sixth year of elementary school. Um, and so lots of great work happening across the district and I think it's important that we recognize as this slide does um, that engagement and that communication is foundational to all the work that then happens the rest of the year. I, I think I will point out, and we've talked about this at various times over the years in this setting, we do not want the first communication that occurs between a family and a school official, whether it's an administrator or a teacher, to be for some negative reason. And I think the more we can be explicit and the more systemic we can be in our communications up front in a very positive way, um, it makes it less likely, uh, not ironically, and not coincidentally, that those negative kinds of conversations may have to occur later on. Um, but if, if, if they do, at least there'll be an opportunity to build some foundational trust and mutual understanding before that first communication um, for missing homework assignment or missed class may have to occur. So here on the next slide, uh, on slide seven, you see an overview of some of the pre-K-12 priorities that our apartments and schools are and will be focusing on as we open the new school year. Um, as we've referenced previously, curriculum and learning supports and behavioral health that you see represented on this slide really are interdependent um, and cannot and should not be taught in silos. Um, behavioral health serves as a foundation for achieving academic goals while academic instruction provides an opportunity uh, likewise to teach and practice behavioral health. Uh, so it's imperative, of course, uh, that we're ensuring that behavioral health is woven into and throughout academic instructional times um, to support and deepen that learning. Uh, in the interest of time, we won't go through all of these priorities today, although I will share and we'll talk more about this in the second presentation we will be providing with uh, an overview to you of some of those future topics, many of which are grounded in some of these bullets that you see. And so while we won't be able to get to all of these and do all of them justice today, our intent is to spend some time in the coming months, whether it be in a student achievement committee setting like this or in a work session to go deeper because um, there's a lot of work behind each of these bullets that you see. Um, you do see a, a few examples up here, professional learning, um, which we'll talk more about in just a few minutes in our second topic. That's always important um, for all staff, not just school-based staff and instructional staff, but operational and otherwise. But it's particularly important in the environment that we're in right now where we're coming out of a pandemic where it's been very, very difficult to provide comprehensive training and professional learning across the district given the circumstances of the past couple of years. Um, we've also taken note of the fact that we have hired somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,700 new teachers in the past couple of years. And so there are a lot of teachers that are brand new that probably have not 
gotten the level of professional learning around curriculum supports, pedagogical and instructional methods and others that they would have typically been able to receive. Um, you know, a lot of our training has been focused on more immediate emergency response type issues, whether it's how we provide remote instruction or how we, uh, even though it's not best practice, provide concurrent teaching if we've got kids that are in front of us and some that are at home and remote. Um, those have been areas of focus dictated by our circumstances the past couple of years. So we're excited about the potential to get back in that lane, in that space. Um, and obviously there's urgency uh, and priority there. Uh, another area that we'll mention here that we'll talk more about in the weeks and months ahead, data um, to inform and monitor teaching and learning. And, and we don't just mean, in fact, we, you know, we mean a whole lot more than just the data points that we often talk about that are more summative in nature, like an EOC or an EOG score, growth or proficiency, grad rates are really many after the fact kind of, um, you know, metrics that are important to measure and monitor, but it doesn't necessarily inform instruction for an individual student. And so um, our teachers and schools are immersed again in the use of um, progress monitoring tools, assessment tools, screeners, other data points, and we'll talk a little bit more about those in a few minutes, um, because more than ever, it's critical that our teachers have an understanding of exactly what the needs of their students are. That's always important, um, but given the range of impacts that we've felt over the last couple of years with the pandemic, you know, we throw around terms like learning loss. We've got to be really, really careful at the classroom level not to presume that the impact has been the same for every single student. Um, and so one of the things that we will spend some time on in the weeks and months ahead is ensuring that our teachers and our instructional leaders in schools have access to the data they need in a formative way, in an ongoing way to inform instruction, make adjustments, uh, and ensure that the needs of every individual student is being met. Uh, you also see several priorities here related to social, emotional, and behavioral health. Um, you, you understand uh, probably better than I do. We learned many lessons during the pandemic. And one of the most important is that we must continue to focus on caring for ourselves uh, and for each other. Uh, that's why behavioral health and well being are both key components of revisions to the ongoing and, and uh, still to be updated strategic plan. It's also why we're working to strengthen existing programs and launch new work um, to ensure that our schools and our students have the resources they need to be successful. And you also see referenced on here, not to be completely forgotten. Um, I mean, this is still our reality. Uh, while we have shifted our approach from response um, and emergency response to longer term recovery, and we've lifted many of our COVID-19 restrictions, um, we feel it's important to continue to closely track and report uh, positivity rates, and we'll continue to follow the latest CDC protection and prevention guidance. Um, and who knows what the future holds, whether it's short term or longer term. And so, you know, behind the curtain, even though it might not be the, the outward priority that has been the past couple of years by necessity, um, I think it's incumbent upon all of our teams, all of our schools to always be thinking about those what if scenarios um, and have plans and contingencies ready for anything that might happen. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago, a year and maybe two months ago, that there was a hope and an aspiration that we were out of the woods. And I think we can all look back now and realize that was, um, that was a mistaken assumption that, and hope that we had. Um, and so we don't want to rest on our laurels and assume that everything will be fine. Uh, and the trajectory that we're currently on is gonna stay that way. It could very well be a bumpy road of some ups and downs and we wanna be prepared for that. So the next slide, we'll get into a few highlights from our levels um, shared by our, our uh, level staff, elementary, middle, and high school. Um, first of all, elementary school, uh, we've got two new traditional calendar elementary schools that are opening, Apex Friendship and Barton Pond Elementary Schools, both on a traditional calendar. So those kids will start their first day in their new building um, a week from today. Uh, also, we wanted to point out all K-5 intervention and AIG teachers in Wake County have completed unit one of letters training. That's a, that's a, big, uh, a big achievement given the logistics and the scope and the scale of that work that you are well aware of at this point. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes in our professional learning update. Um, we're also happy to report that teachers are enthusiastic. We're seeing about professional learning opportunities outside of letters. Um, we've, it's been well documented and we've discussed the impact and the time 
that letters training will require. Um, but there are other offerings that we want to make available as well um, to ensure that we're meeting the needs of our teachers, um, and, you know, for any additional time that they have beyond the training that they're required to engage in for letters. Uh, we've got teachers signing up for, for professional learning opportunities around curriculum resources. Um, Sarita has shared uh, particularly around all block uh, with EL education. Uh, we've been able to add additional sessions to move teachers off waiting lists that have signed up for those sessions. And again, credit to our teachers who are signing up for these and showing a want and a desire for this learning in addition to the comprehensive graduate level course that they're being required to take for letters, um, which I think is, is worth pointing out and another highlight just that I think is, uh, illustrates the work ethic and the commitment that our teachers have um, beyond just the regular instructional day and beyond what's required. Um, we also wanted to highlight the annual partnership with Marbles Museum for the kickoff to kindergarten that occurred this past Saturday. Uh, district staff, including principals, assistant principals, and kindergarten teachers served as experts uh, that were available to answer parent questions. Um, another item that we wanted to mention, Education Week, just recently featured a series on the science of reading that highlighted national, state, and local approaches. Uh, in two Wake County Public School System schools, Lacey Elementary and Walnut Creek Elementary, were both featured in that series. And so uh, if you haven't seen that, we're happy to, to share that link with you. It's a great article, very exhaustive and comprehensive and really sheds, I think, a lot of light on the great work that's happening in Wake around that work. Um, and then, of course, we, we uh, wanted to highlight also the work that you're familiar with at this point around Wake Together. Uh, and we anticipate continuing to move forward with that and uh, looking forward to some positive results uh, in a large number of our elementary schools around high dosage tutoring uh, in the months ahead. And then also, uh, as, you, as you well know, Read to Achieve again was conducted this summer. That con has now concluded across calendars. Uh, we will be sharing an update on student outcomes, attendance, uh, and teacher and family and student perception uh, based on survey results. I believe that's scheduled for our October Student Achievement Committee meeting, and we'll be sure to include additional updates on other summer learning programs that occurred as well. So moving on to middle school. Uh, likewise, we have uh, another new school opening, this one at the middle school level, Herbert Aikens Road Middle, a year-round school that's now serving the Fuqua Arena area. Um, incredibly, this now pushes the total of middle schools in Wake County to 45. So we've now got 45 middle schools in the district. Um, we're also excited to mention uh, that West Millbrook Magnet Middle, um, after a long time and a lot of work and um, you know, a winding path to get there is opening an incredible new facility on their existing campus, and we're excited about what that's going to mean for students in terms of their access to the very best resources that, that we have to offer for them. Uh, multiple middle schools also participated in summer planning uh, for incoming sixth grade students, and we've, we've worked uh, to be more intentional and more systemic in our approach to this work. School teams planned opening sessions for their rising ninth grade students. Uh, they built ideas and strategies around relationship building opportunities for new students and staff and also designed interactive and informative school tours. Um, middle schools, and going back to my previous comments about those metrics and ongoing formative assessments, middle schools will also be utilizing a new diagnostic reporting and progress monitoring tool. It's called FastBridge. If you hear that term, um, you'll hear more about that in the weeks and months ahead. Um, but principals, teachers, and instructional staff at the middle school level have received professional learning with the resource uh, through the summer as they prepare to implement this important tool moving forward in the year ahead, um, specifically around reading as a progress monitoring tool for grades six through eight. Um, we mentioned sixth grade orientations. Um, also wanted to mention that middle school athletic teams will start fall sports the last week of August. Um, and I think four sports in the fall in middle school, including football, cheerleading, girls soccer, and volleyball, and certainly not to be outdone, the arts will be welcoming back um, fall performances this fall um, with many art exhibits. Uh, Freddie Lee Heath also wanted me to mention that middle and high school arts programs will be receiving an increase in funding this year as part of the new budget that the board approved recently. Um, which we anticipate will better support the work of our schools, particularly in the area of making their programs more equitable and accessible for all students. So um, we're excited about that, that opportunity on the horizon and the additional support um, that schools will now have. 
Last but certainly not least, um, a few beginning of the year highlights from our high schools. Um, again, we uh, have successfully now opened Wake Early College of Information and Biotechnologies on the RTP campus in Morrisville. Um, I understand they have 10 teachers serving 127 students in some really exciting new programs, um, things like cybersecurity, computer programming, network management, and biotechnology. Um, also related to CTE, across all CTE programs, uh, I think you're already aware students participated this summer in our Career Accelerator program, 200 plus. Again, we'll be sharing more about that in, uh, in a future meeting. Uh, future or community partners that were involved in this work, we wanted to kind of highlight some of those. Junior Achievement, WakeEd Partnership, uh, Connect for Success, business partners like Bobbitt, Delta, the North Carolina Department of Transportation, UNC Rex, Martin Marietta, Wake Tech, and many, many, many others. So we really appreciate the collaboration and the support um, from those community groups and businesses. Freshman orientation programs and new parent orientations are back to face-to-face -face events, although uh, schools are providing uh, virtual options as needed. Again, working to be accommodating to families um, uh, based on their individual needs and accommodations as necessary to make all of our students, particularly those perhaps that have not been back in person in a couple of years to make sure that is a smooth transition and I, you know that's something i think that we certainly are aware of um, but you know we had roughly uh, i think at its peak this past school year 12,000 plus students that were in our virtual academy those students are integrating back into in-person instruction uh, given the fact that it's likely that the vast majority of those 12,000 also spent the previous year as part of the 85,000 that were in the virtual academy, in, in some instances we've got kids that have not been back for in-person instruction in over two years. And so um, kudos to our schools and our staff for working to address the unique needs of that group. And so it's not lost on us that not everybody is arriving even though they may be in the same class. We could have, you know, eighth graders that have been at the, the middle school for three years and some of those eighth graders may never have actually set foot in the building, uh, at least for in-person in instruction. And so it's just, an, it's amazing to think about it in those terms, which is why it's so important for us to ensure that we're, uh, we're being strategic and thoughtful about the needs of all of our kids. Um, for the first time in two years, uh, we're excited to be hosting the Science Olympiad Tournament coming up in February. Believe it or not, plans are already in motion. I think the plan right now is for that to be uh, hosted at Leesville Road High School um, in preparation for that event. A lot of work goes into that, both at the district and the school level. Fingers crossed we'll be able to carry out that event um, coming up in February. We've discussed previously our driver's ed program is returning to uh, pre-pandemic classes this fall, continuing to work through the backlog for behind the wheel instruction that formed over the two years of the pandemic. Like middle school, our athletics and arts programs are back into full swing. Uh, this past Friday night was the kickoff for the, the 22 season for football and so many other related activities. Um, so there's a buzz and an excitement, um, I think, in our schools that probably hasn't risen to that level in, in a couple of years for obvious reasons. And then finally, we did want to make mention um, that district staff will be working closely with school level coordinators um, on a voter registration drive this fall beginning in September. And I'm, I'm sure we'll be sharing more information on that, uh, that initiative in the weeks ahead as well. So just a quick closing here, uh, look at what's ahead. Um, our school leaders, our teachers, our district staff, as you know, have spent countless hours preparing, um, you know, in various stages with multiple calendars, that work looks a little bit different. Um, looking ahead, we've got traditional calendar schools, of course, that open a week from today. Um, district staff, we wanted to make mention of this, will be engaging in school visits to maintain a, a, a on the ground understanding of the experiences of our students and staff. It's little things like that that maybe prior to the pandemic we, we took for granted, the ability to go out and just visit in large numbers schools, um, kind of on a, on a calendared strategic um, systemic way that we have not been able to do systematically um, in some instances over the past couple of years. So we're looking forward to be able to get out and do that on a more regular basis. Uh, we'll continue, of course, to align our district and school supports for high quality teaching and learning. Um, and we'll discuss more in a few minutes. Um, you know, we'll be implementing a comprehensive professional learning program across the district really for the first time in two years that gets back to 
I prioritize focused on teaching and learning um, and also social, emotional, and behavioral health. So uh, we appreciate the time to share a little bit about the highlights um, that have occurred thus far or that are about to occur, and we are certainly happy to share more information or any answer any questions that you may have. Mr. Cook, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, it, it was great capturing uh, where we were a year ago and, and where we're at now um, and, and getting a good handle of the trajectory that we can look forward to this year. Um, so thank you so much for that information. I did want to note that um, our committee member, Christine Kushner, is here with us as well. Oh, no, 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 that's okay. Just wanted to make for the record that we, uh, that we have you noted here. Um, and I'll go ahead and open it up to my colleagues for any questions uh, or comments on the presentation. Ms. Waters. Oh, thank you so much for this presentation. It's all really exciting work that you're doing. I just had a question about the launching with student family and staff engagement. How are you disseminating information on these events to families and are you finding that uh, families that are re reflective of the school community are participating or are you finding certain groups not as engaged in these activities as you would like to see? I think that's a great question, and I'll, I'll certainly let um, our team chime in with additional specifics. So first of all, um, I, I think that is an ongoing priority and it has to be a priority um, in terms of ensuring that all families feel connected and engaged. Certainly, you know, our Title I department works closely with Title I schools to ensure that we are, um, you know, strategic but also committed and really, really aggressive in our approach to engage families. Um, you know, I think so there's both school level and district level communications that occur. Um, there's, there's some incredibly creative, I think, opportunities that schools work to provide for families. Um, you know, providing childcare, for example, providing meals to be able to bring families in, recognizing even time of day. Um, you know, again, depending on whether it's elementary, middle, or high, um, not just offering, you know, a one-shot opportunity in some cases on one day at one time that maybe falls on somebody's work hours. Uh, and so trying to provide multiple, if it's an in-person event, multiple opportunities. Um, I think I mentioned even providing virtual opportunities for those that may not be able to come in person. Um, you know, and I, I, I can't speak to any specific data uh, in terms of participation rates, but I think we've got to acknowledge that's, that's been a longstanding challenge to ensure that the families that are participating in the orientation events, in the camps, are reflective of the diverse communities that our schools serve. And, um, you know, again, kudos to the work that our schools are engaged in to try to bring in families, whatever it takes, ultimately. And if I missed anything, y'all feel free to jump in. That's a great question, Ms. Waters. And I, I know some schools, as part of their school improvement plan, often have targeted family engagement, um, particularly with um, families who English is not their primary language. So I think, um, and I know we get that information about school improvement plans at the end of the school year. Is that right? I can't remember what time of year, but that's, that's interesting to see how many schools maybe have that as part of their, um, their uh, school improvement um, plan. In terms of engagement, so I think I would. I think I would add. If, correct me if I'm wrong. If if you are a school that receives Title One funding, you're required to have a pretty comprehensive family engagement plan as a part of correct. your school improvement plan. They go hand in hand together, um, and so there's a lot of that work that is monitored and created at the school level. Um, I do think there is an expectation that all schools include work around how they're going to engage families um, as a part of their school improvement efforts, but the but Title I schools are required uh, to ensure that that piece is in there. Yes. And what about language uh, interpreters? Do you know how often uh, schools will have access to that at their um, their engagement events? Yeah, again, I would say regularly, um, you know, given the diverse communities that our, our schools serve, whether they're Title I or not, um, I know that schools across grade levels, um, you know, are really careful to ensure if it's a written communication that it's translated into Spanish um, or even other languages as needed if they have larger populations. Um, you know, I, I have talked and heard directly from multiple principals who have brushed up on some college Spanish that they took, for example, 
in order to be able to communicate directly with families. And so even, you know, I've, I've attended an event um, a few weeks ago where, you know, everything that was said in English was simultaneously then translated in Spanish real time in the same room, right? And so I think little things like that, that I mean, they're really not little, they're critically important. Um, and I, I think more and more of our schools recognize the growing population that they serve. Um, and it, it's just incumbent upon us, whether it's a written memo or an email, uh, a voice messenger that goes out that's also translated, or if it's an in-person opportunity that we're ensuring that people are able to access the information that's being shared. Absolutely, thank you for that. And I think that's, um, we never wanna put, uh, I don't know if we're the strategic plan, I'm just thinking out loud here, but as we um, look for measurable success with these types of goals, um, with, without necessarily placing a great burden upon schools, but being able to track that success, even non-Title I schools, when we look at disaggregated data at each of those schools, we're aware that there are populations who could benefit from any additional um, uh, engagement uh, strategy. So I appreciate all of that. Ms. Waters, did you have any other questions? Ms. Cash? So I feel like I've gotten more uh, invites this year, I, and I've seen a lot of excitement over schools opening, but more invites to go to, to the outlying areas from our schools. Um, and I've been to several, and the one, the one, of course, where the Durant schools came together and went to Marsh Creek, um, they they brought in so much of central office support that and had a very large crowd, like a very large crowd um, of parents and kids, but then reached out to the community to bring in all of the resources for that community that could also be there. So there might have been like 25 tables set up for resources. Um, I just, I was overwhelmed by the amount of help the families got at that, and I hope we do a lot of those. But I, I have noticed more outlying invitations to go out to those communities. So I'm glad to see that. Great. That's fantastic. One of the um, festivals that the town of Nightdale has, the Arts and Education Festival, um, what I love about that is they don't just have the food trucks and um, you know the games and, and concerts and things, but they also have information about um, Medicaid, or um, they have food security, uh, clothing security, and they have all, there, there's, it really is like a little something for everything. And, and I saw Durant Rhodes, the social media pictures, and that was a very well attended event. So super thankful to our schools that think of these creative ideas and, and go out there and make sure they're serving, they're serving everyone who, who goes to those schools. Do we, uh, Dr. Barton? Thank you. Um, as we think about opening the new schools, um, or not new schools, but uh, all of our schools, um, and you noted a little bit in terms of pro professional development and staffing how I think you, your number was like 2,700 new teachers over the last couple of years. <clears throat> um, I guess maybe a two-part question. What, what is our staffing going to look like with the opening of schools? Um, we've heard various reports that hiring is difficult. We, that's not local, it's not new to us, but it's, it is a national issue. Um, you know, so, so what are we looking at there? What, how many schools are, are, how many classrooms are gonna have, you know, subs instead of teachers in the classroom? And somewhat related to that, when I've spoke to some principals, I've heard that the number of candidates applying for any given position is a lower than normal. Um, and I don't want to in any way downplay the value of every teacher that we hire, but um, the, the, the depth of experience appears to be shallower than in many years. Um, you know, we'd, we'd love to have six to 12 people applying for every one position and we're now, as far as I've been hearing, lucky even to have one person applying for that position. So that just in reality, it calls for a different level of professional development than maybe traditional professional development. A lot of what I heard, I think, fit a little bit more in the traditional um, professional development. Um, what is in place um, f 
for I, I think it's going to require a different kind of professional development when the incoming pool doesn't have the depth of experience that we might have normally had. Does that make, I mean, like I said, I, I don't want to in, in any way come across as saying, you know, we took you because that's all we could get. Uh, but at the same time, from an institutional perspective, I think we do have an obligation to recognize there is going to be n new challenges. How are we developing professional development to try to meet that challenge? That's a great question, and I'll, I'll start responding, and Superintendent Moore may, may be more adept at providing some of the details in terms of um, some of the information that you're receiving. First of all, I think um, we, too, are hearing and seeing the same kind of feedback going to your first question in terms of staffing. Uh, and again, the, the superintendent can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the most recent number I heard was, you know, even at a, at a 97 percent staffing level in our schools, there is wide variance from school to school where mm -hmm. some schools are fully staffed um, and some schools have multiple vacancies. And, you know, for example, Mr. Fitz and I heard from a middle school last week where I think they have one science teacher across all grade levels to serve all of those students. And I think, um, you know, and, I, and I'll, I, this is an anecdotal story, but I think it's illustrative of what you just described. The, the district staff that was going to be the lead support for that work, um, we've since learned will be transitioning. And so it, it's, a, it's a kind of multifaceted challenge where, you know, academics is in task with the responsibility and rightfully of providing supports to long-term subs and lesson plans and, and resources. And I think, you know, not only are we getting pinched a little bit on the school side, you know, we're seeing in real time our own capacity at the district level at times, again, depending on the grade level, depending on the content area, to be able to provide that kind of support that typically we would have had no problem providing. Um, and so it's it's kind of a perfect storm in some schools in some places where, you know, the need is greater for more intensive support. And again, depending on the content area and the grade level, the ability and the capacity of the district to support those needs is more limited. Um, and so I, I think those are real. And I think the staffing concerns are something that I know our HR department, Dr. Matillo and others have been leading. I know we've spent great, a great deal of time last week talking about and, sh and developing strategies for how the district is going to be able to go in and provide support when we have to open up another school year with vacancies um, and what that looks like for long-term subs. Um, and even staffing and hiring plans and prioritizing where the needs are the greatest. And then I think your, the, the second part of your question is real as well. Um, you know, I think I think we, we certainly can say overall in the profession, certainly in the state of North Carolina, um, we're hearing from peers and colleagues in other districts, this is not a unique Wake County challenge. Um, in places where even in, in content areas like social studies, um, where we would typically see lots of applicants, we're not necessarily seeing the same numbers of applicants that are coming across. And so that does have an impact on, um, you know, the pool of, of potential candidates that schools are hiring. Um, and so I, I think we've got to be smart and we've got to be strategic, to your point, about what that means for professional learning. Um, and even if it's, if it's a, a, somebody who has experience, um, I think we've got to recognize and be able, just like we monitor progress and identify needs for our students, we, we probably are, well, not probably, we are in a position where we're going to have to be able to identify the needs of our teachers, whether they're veterans or brand new to the district. Um, and I think, and we'll share a little bit about, to, to get more at the heart of your question, part two, Dr. Martin, in a few minutes. But, you know, I think that places a priority on our ability to find out what it is that teachers need. Um, you know, what, what metrics can we use? What data points can we use? I think a lot of that will involve working with HR and even seeing who's coming in and in certain content areas, it might be lateral entry that doesn't have classroom experience. Um, and and on our HR department, I know, works around the clock to try to provide intensive supports for first year and beginning teachers. Um, but I think to your point, it, there, it does place a premium on our ability to observe and learn and identify what those maybe adjusted needs are based on kind of the marketplace of what hiring looks like right now. And I, I know mm -hmm. uh, Emily will probably talk a little bit about some of what that looks like 
when we talk about professional learning in a few minutes, but certainly don't want to. Um, I, I was just going to add a couple of things to it. I think it's a very real issue when we are, and, and it's and it's not one that's necessarily different than any year because teachers come in at all levels of experiences and backgrounds to us. But I think we need to take a look at the data and see do we have more alternative licensure folks that are coming in? Or is the age and experience younger perhaps or changes in levels or different kinds of things? But I, and, and, but the other thing I, that I want to say, and this works in, in many of our schools, but it doesn't work in the scenario that Drew just mentioned um, about a school that may have one science teacher across grade levels, and that is the, the, the professional learning community support at the school level is incredibly important for that type of support because they are right there on the ground with their kids, looking at their data, working together to look at student data, plan together, look at assessments together, progress monitor together. So a lot of that work would happen there. But in, in, in the instance of either a PLC that's not functioning well or that there are not enough teachers at the school or what, a singleton, then that does fall to central services for us to know where those situations lie and for how we then respond and provide support. It's going to take strong communication from the school level to central services to let us know where that need exists, and then it's going to take good flexibility on our part at the central services letter to be, level to be responsive to that. I think in looking at the overall spate of professional learning that's offered, we, we try to offer from the get-go a wide variety uh, that is differentiated both by the type of content and need as well as even the modality that it's presented in. Um, but but I would say that we can certainly always take a look at that and see is it responding to the needs of folks and we get that through feedback and did we set it up sufficiently that way on the front end. And people vote with their feet some in professional learning as well. You see who's signing up for what and who's not signing up for what. That gives us some information as well. And we do regularly review that also. So those are a few things. If I might add, um, you know, it reminds me a little bit, you know, in class, you sometimes, particularly at the university level, I'll, I'll get a student taking an upper level class where have they really had the background for it or not? And I think one of the most important things to communicate early is don't wait till you're struggling to ask for help. Um, uh, right, if you're, if you're a teacher who, take my field, right, you're trained in biology, but you're assigned to teach chemistry. And oh crap, I gotta teach it. And I've had, I've worked with several teachers in that, in that specific scenario, so I'll, I'll take that as an example. When you're in that scenario, you, have a tendency to want to show that you are actually capable and can do the job. And it's very easy under those circumstances to say, I gotta figure out how to do this myself because if I ask for help, I'm, it's a sign of weakness, I, you know, or it's, it's reinforcing that I'm not quite adequate. And so I just really encourage us to message from the district level um, that, look, teaching is hard. We all know that, even to the veteran teacher but particularly as new people are getting started, if, if we just very clearly message, ask for help early, don't wait till it's sort of overwhelming, I think that can really help um, get us to a stronger place, um, particularly with, with a lot of new people coming in who maybe don't have quite the same skill level or experience level, I should say, not necessarily skill level. Yes, sir. How we message it, right? It's like all mental health stuff, right? Is it stigmatized or is it, hey, this is normal. We're here to help. The messaging really can make a big difference in the, in the ending success. Thank you for that, Dr. Martin. Um, I just have one question, and I should have thought of this ahead of time um, because it's more of a technical uh, question, but as we're related to engagement um, at, throughout the school year for um, parents and guardians to be able to get a better understanding of what their child is working on because we know that there may be the, the this is third grade math and ideally day 30 they're doing this, but we know that you know sometimes they're spending more time on a content area and or moving ahead. Um, where is the district right now in terms of streamlining Google Classroom or Canvas or how, um, I know that was difficult with training teachers last year with, with so many things, but where are we with having um, sort of a, an expectation 
for parents to be able to tap into what their kiddos are doing, especially since so much of it is not, necess is not necessarily being brought home. Does that question make sense? Yes, ma'am. It's, it's a great question and an important one, of course, and it's something that we've talked about um, going back to the spring of 2020 when um, we had, you know, multiple LMSs, um, learning management systems that were being utilized. And if you'll recall, um, we made the step, I believe, going into the fall of 2020 to narrow that down to Canvas and Google. Um, and so I, I, I believe uh, maybe we made reference to this in the spring. We have now made plans uh, looking ahead. The goal to your question, Ms. Scott, is to streamline and move all, to a single LMS as a district to Canvas in the fall of 23. So for the 23-24 school year, our goal, um, and we're providing ourselves on purpose a, a year plus runway to get there, um, is to have a streamlined kind of single access point for parents via Canvas. Um, you know, Google resources can still be, you know, housed within Canvas, um, but, you know, I think we are, we are also cognizant of the fact that, you know, for those that have been using Google Classroom uh, extensively for the last couple of years, there's some work involved, whether uh, it's district staff that are going to have to, you know, make some te technical adjustments to get resources loaded into Canvas or schools that maybe um, have not yet uh, move to Canvas, there's some work that's going to be involved there. So I think, you know, the, the best guidance that we would provide to parents and families right now in the meantime is just to maintain direct communication with teachers in terms of knowing where those resources are, um, being able to provide access to content, to instructional supports, uh, tutoring videos, all those kinds of things. Um, whether it's in Canvas or in Google, we want to make sure families, parents, students know where they can access. So I think, you know, right now it's communication with the teacher, kind of as always, as the default mode to make sure parents are aware of homework helps and resources that are there for their kids. Um, but yes, ma'am, the goal is by this time next year, will be uh, everything will be under the umbrella of Canvas. And I, I personally think that's a great goal to, to allow that that a lengthy runway so that you know, as we use the word, like with fidelity, it can be, um, you know, implemented at each school. And I think that's great to hear. It's, um, it, it can be challenging for some parents to, to reach out to their teachers sometimes if they, they don't want to bother them, they don't want to, you know, strain them. It, it can be uh, tricky, I think, for some parents um, to understand that, you know, often that communication is welcome and encouraged, but it, it can be just a challenge for some people, I think, to feel comfortable reaching out to their child's teacher um, and then of course middle school students have a lot of teachers um, so they they might have more in one given uh, semester than uh, than certainly an elementary or even high school uh, student so I appreciate that um, that information because I know that's you know our what we hear consistently is that our families want to uh, feel engaged in their kiddos and that's great so we're glad to hear that I don't um, I think my colleagues have any other questions. So I do, I again, thank you so much for this presentation. And we certainly do have a lot of challenges this year, but I really want to emphasize that there is a lot of hope and there is just a magic that happens inside of a classroom. And if someone is thinking about uh, becoming an educator and we still have access to lateral um, entry, follow your heart. I don't, I don't think any teacher regrets a moment of the engagement that they have with their students and their classrooms. Um, it's a very difficult job, but inside of our schools each and every day, there is magic that is happening and joy, and it is worth it. So I want us to not necessarily, we're not painting a, a rosy picture here, but I, I want people to know that there is hope and there's so much good. So. Thank you for, for highlighting the start to our school year. And uh, thank you so much for being here today. And we will go ahead and transition to the second part of our committee. And Mr. Cook, I'm just gonna turn it 
over to you again uh, for the second part as we hear more about professional learning and uh, and also the letters training implementation. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Y'all are going to be tired of hearing from me by the time we're done. But um, uh, m fortunately, um, Emily Mountford is here, our senior director for the Office of Professional Learning, um, who I, I just want to say that over the last few years, um, having been in central services, you know, going on seven years now, there has been a concerted effort, and I think going back to Dr. Martin's question earlier, which is a great segue, a concerted effort to ensure that we're being truly collaborative with all stakeholders in how we land on what a professional learning plan looks like. And there's a lot of work involved across a lot of teams and departments, and also across our 195 plus schools as well. Um, so we, we look forward to the opportunity to dig in a little deeper on you know one of those priorities that we referenced in those bullets. And that's really the purpose um, of our, our time here in the second presentation with you. So um, as we look at the, the next slide, and I, you know again, there's no need to re-reference in too much depth and detail here other than to say, you know, this slide and the following slide both really do help us ground our work in terms of strategy and identifying priorities. And I think, Dr. Martin, again, the segue question that you asked was pertinent because when we're talking about reimagining and redefining um, and resolving to do the work, I think uh, it's incumbent upon us to identify what are the shifting needs of staff and whether we're talking about instructional staff in a school uh, or on the operational side uh, at the district uh, or, or otherwise, we've got to be able to identify what their needs are so we can provide support that, as we say so often, feels like support um, and that is accessible and useful uh, and ultimately helps provide the individualized needs um, that our students have. And so that's, that's our goal in the remaining time that we have with you today. Um, obviously, one of the seven priorities that you see identified on this slide is around professional learning. And, you know, one of the things that, that is important, again, to point out is that we, we haven't had the ability to provide kind of that comprehensive professional learning plan for a lot of different reasons uh, based on the emergent needs that we were facing over the last two years. And we're excited. And the work has already started. And, you know, Emily will be sharing more in a few minutes about um, some of the work that's already occurring. Um, you know, this past Friday, we had a district-wide professional learning day across all calendars. Um, and we're excited about some of the feedback um, that we're already receiving. And, you know, and some of that feedback is, you know, not always glowing. And we can be transparent about that. And I think one of the things you'll hear Emily share a little bit about is how we use feedback and critiques around whether it's the modality of how we're providing the professional learning, whether it's in person, synchronous, asynchronous, um, how it's structured, how much time we're spending on certain topics. Um, you know, we, we are going to be strategic and go out of our way to make sure we're getting that feedback every time we provide a training. And then it's incumbent upon us to take the feedback and apply it and perhaps make adjustments even with the same training that may occur a month later. If we're doing what we should be doing, it'll look slightly different based on kind of those learnings that we had initially. And I know Emily will talk more about that in a few minutes as well. But um, here on this slide, you see a little bit about, again, referencing back to our strategic plan, um, core belief number three, well-supported, highly effective and dedicated principals, teachers and staff are essential to success for all students. I don't think there's much argument on that belief. Um, but, but I think we can also reemphasize that's always been important, but it's probably never been more important than it is right now, given the challenges um, that we were talking about just a few minutes ago, given the staffing uh, shortages that we're still seeing in places. Um, and even where we have veteran teachers and uh, instructional leaders in place, what's on their plate is really, really difficult to measure. Uh, and quantify. And so I think, you know, for any, any professional learning or training program to be effective, we've got to be able to acknowledge that reality, which, by the way, is exactly what we should be doing in our classrooms. We've got to be able to meet students where we are, where they are, um, you know, read the room, for lack of a better description, um, recognize that at times, depending on when a professional learning session might be offered, um, you know, if it's the, at the end of a school day, you're, you're dealing with folks who may be exhausted after being in a classroom all day. Um, if it's like it was this past Friday on a teacher work day, um, it's probably going to be at least some distractions where I'm thinking about if I'm a teacher, how I've got to get my classroom set up for meet the teacher night two days later. 
all those kinds of details and nuances are really, really hard to quantify um, and spell out concretely, but it's the reality that our teachers and schools face every single day. Um, and then here you see a quote from Michael Fullen that talks a little bit about you know, ongoing job embedded professional learning and support for implementation at the individual team and school district level, strengthens communities of practice uh, and also reinforces collective responsibility and purpose, which is of course our goal for any professional learning plan. That's always been important, but never more so than now. Um, as we look at the next slide, just a quick overview of desired outcomes for the time we've got this afternoon. Uh, we do want to share with you the, the continuous improvement cycle that Emily will share a little bit about um, that informs professional learning. We also, uh, you know, we couldn't talk about professional learning right now unless we provided a little bit of an update on letters, which we'll do. Uh, we'll also provide an overview of professional learning structures and offerings. So both in terms of how logistically things are structured and how content is delivered, but also a little bit of an overview of the content itself. Um, and we'll also share an overview of upcoming information uh, and presentations with the board. So we'll close with a slide that I made reference to a few minutes ago, just to kind of give you a little bit of a forecast um, that more information um, in the spirit of what we're doing around professional learning today on other topics, we'll be taking some deeper dives and some closer looks in more detail um, than just some of the quick overviews that we provided a few minutes ago. Um, so here on this slide, just a little bit in terms of the feedback that um, Dr. Martin asked about a little while ago and how we're able to identify truly what is supportive and what is needed. Um, we know that we have to work to ensure that our support feels like just that, support. Um, you know, to give you an example, one of the biggest challenges sometimes with beginning teachers is finding how we provide them with information that's useful and relevant and at the same time acknowledge that they are already working around the clock and stretched thinly. And probably the last thing that sometimes I wanted to do as a beginning teacher was to be asked to go spend two hours after school, three days a month about beginning teacher training. And so acknowledging that reality is important. Um, and that, that was important even in the best of circumstances, certainly in the environment um, and the challenges that are being faced today for new teachers, um, uh, more inexperienced teachers, I think we've got to recognize that reality and work really hard to do so. Um, as reference, we have established a multidisciplinary team uh, in teams to plan and align district PL um, that includes professional learning subcommittee and also a school leadership design and planning team. So we've got teams across departments um, with multiple representatives, also feedback loops with schools. Um, as part of our planning, we do work to elicit feedback through multiple forms, uh, such as surveys, focus groups, uh, professional learning participation and registration data. Uh, Superintendent Moore referenced a few minutes ago, one of the most important data points we can gain is whether or not people are showing up, or maybe more importantly, after the first session, what happens to attendance after that? Um, and that's, a, that's kind of a hard thing sometimes when we've got, whether it's central services staff or school staff that work really, really hard to provide what we hope and intend to be a really engaging, informative, professional learning session, and to kind of get the slap in the face at times that says, well, it didn't really land. Um, but being able to look ourselves in the mirror and say, you know what, let's adjust course, let's make a change, let's listen to the feedback, and let's try it differently next time um, to be more effective. And so I, I do think we've got some systemic processes in place um, to help us do that. Um, obviously, you know, the purpose of those feedback loops is to inform, um, inform us and inf inform our facilitators about the successes, the challenges, the needs, so we can design timely and relevant professional learning. And also, so that the contents and topics are tailored to meet the needs of our staff. Um, and just like is the case for our students, those needs are diverse um, and they're ever shifting. And so it's really important to keep a pulse on what that looks like. So here in the next slide, I mentioned letters. Just a few quick updates before um, we transition it over to Emily to let her take us through the, the remainder of the presentation. Um, we are working on a streamlined process that's been created for new hires, speaking of new teachers, uh, to ensure proper placement within the appropriate letters professional learning unit. Um, I, I cannot say enough about the work that our human resources department, that 
our academics teams, uh, finance, and others. If you can imagine hundreds, I mentioned 2,700 new teachers, hundreds of those teachers coming in the last six months to a year from other districts who are at various stages in different cohorts in their letters training. So trying to figure out, like we've got our cohorts already established, we started last year, how we integrate which staff members and at what grade level and at what school into what um, training is a, it's incredible to think about the puzzle they're working to put together. And that's going on right now. I mean, we're, we're hiring teachers right now as we speak. And one of the things that Michelle Woodson and uh, Dr. McTillo and others from HR have to do, they've got to figure out what district they came from whether or not you've had the first module or not, or oh, you're halfway through the module, and so we've got to incorporate you into this training session. It is, it is a Herculean effort um, just to figure out where our new teachers are coming from and what their needs are in terms of letters training. I um, also wanted to mention that professional learning for the 22-23 school year will continue to be uh, delivered virtually, um, again, both synchronously and asynchronously. Um, schools will allow flexibility and agency for teachers to work individually uh, or also as a PLC during early release days, as if you recall back in our conversations in the spring. The purpose and intent of those early release days, at least at the elementary level, is to provide time not for the formal live training sessions, that um, th there are multiple of those, but it's to provide time for, for lack of a better description, the homework that's required in between those live sessions that has to occur. And so um, schools are doing things like setting up study groups within their PLCs, within grade levels, um, because there's hours and hours worth of work that has to occur outside what that formal training looks like when it's delivered for the first time. Um, we've also created a, a letters asynchronous course uh, for instructional assistants uh, to engage in during early release days. And so we're trying to be conscientious while that group is not necessarily included as part of the required training across the state. We want to provide access to them because they're so critical and will be so critical to the implementation of what this work looks like. Um, schools are no longer split and are now able to engage in learning sessions together. And so we've been able to kind of streamline now where schools are kind of within the same cohort and teachers in the same building can all work together. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to mention, I don't think it's on one of the bullets, we will be coming back to the board, I believe, in early September to formalize um, the, the direction that we discussed back in the spring around the district bonus payments for participation and successful completion of letters training. And so there's a, just from a technical standpoint, we have to have formal board approval. We'll be bringing that forward in September. Um, I think our expectation is, is the first round of bonus payments to district staff that are engaged in this training would begin in November. And so um, that's just from a technical standpoint, I wanted to make mention that you'll be hearing a little bit more about that in a couple of weeks. All right, Emily. Thank you, good afternoon. Um, I enjoyed hearing the dialogue earlier about professional learning and hopefully some of what I share will answer some of your questions and then look forward to hearing your feedback. Um, looking at the current slide, I'm going to be covering six different structures that we currently have to provide professional learning to different staff members. So that's school-based professional learning, central service-based professional learning, academic advancement team beginning of year learning, early release days, professional learning days, as well as school leadership meetings. So we'll start with school-based uh, professional learning. Each school conducts their own professional learning throughout the year. Guidance is provided to schools to help with planning, structure, design, to ensure that schools are able to meet the varying needs of their staff. Strategic and relevant professional learning should be designed to support teachers and staff in acquiring the skills needed to implement district strategic plan as well as the individual school improvement plan and then individual staff's professional development plans. There's a number of important considerations when to take into account when the school is strategically planning out their professional learning for staff. Um, things that should be included for that are the district's goals, the school's goals, data that is specifically tied to the school, the staff's needs, as well as their academic calendar and other critical professional learning offerings from the district. 
one primary consideration in mapping out the professional learning is your calendar. So schools are looking at what teacher work days they have, when are their early release days, um, when could they provide professional learning maybe during grade level meetings or PLCs or staff meetings. So schools use a variety of opportunities to structure the support for professional learning needs for their school-based staff. And those could be either longer extended professional learner offerings or a shorter term session that may be offered over a period of dates. School administrators, along with their school improvement teams, oversee the planning of their school's professional learning plan. Central service-based professional learning. All central services department provi departments provide professional learning to stakeholders, so to our staff out in schools, as well, as well as maybe staff here at central services. Central service leaders follow professional learning guidance when planning their professional learning to ensure high quality adult learning is available for all. Examples of professional learning um, are included on the slide, but are not limited to what's listed there. So I listed just a few out to give you an idea of what's coming from all the different departments, but obviously it's just a, a short little um, snapshot of what we're providing. So human resources and content specific for new hire training, curriculum and instruction professional learning, instructional assistant um, empowerment, the IA empowerment series that I know I've spoken with y'all before about, school-wide and classroom behavior series, crisis response training, restorative practices and community resilience model professional learning, cognitive coaching and facilitative leadership. Like I said, this is just a example, list of examples and there's much more that we offer. Um, Y'all spoke earlier about Canvas, but one that I wanted to note that isn't on here, there is a lot of professional learning that is being offered this year in many of these structures that I'm sharing that is specifically tied to Canvas that is um, directed toward, towards administrators or the Canvas crew that's leading the work at schools or teachers um, as they're transitioning and getting prepared for next school year when they go into um, implementing Canvas in their classroom. Academic Advancement Team Beginning of Year Learning. Um, this is to provide timely and relevant learning resources and information to staff for staff to ensure a successful opening of the school year. And so this is happening right now uh, for our traditional schools and this has happened throughout the summer for our other calendars. It is being provided asynchronously this year and it's specifically for certain roles like department chairs, new hires, and other employees that may need content specific training. Um, there is, in the past, we've done a specific day that fell in the teacher workday calendar for each calendar. Um, but to provide more flexibility and access for teachers, we've gone to asynchronous and they have two weeks to complete the learning. And so they're able to do that in their own time um, within the teacher workdays when their staff has time to work on their own and they're able to ensure the learning. Shifting to asynchronous model provided, like I said, staff flexibility. Ability, uh, when they can access the content, but it's also still ensuring that we have accountability that they're able to do the learning because we're still able to mo monitor it through the systems that they're doing them in. So next is early release days. Early release days will be available to all teachers pre-K through 12 in the 22-23 school year. These days are a two hour early release. This time is designed to provide teachers with time to either participate in professional learning or collaborate at their school within their PLC. Elementary principals must allow their staff to engage in letters during the early release days. Um, elementary teachers involved in letters would be either using this time to individually complete the portion of the um, six to eight hour virtual online course that they have to do or collaborate in their PLCs to complete the online modules or bridge to practice assignments. So that homework uh, that Drew was talking about could be done um, in this time. Central services may facilitate non-required professional learning on early release days, and these sessions are only going to be virtual just to save on any travel time since it's just the two-hour early release. So there'll be some synchronous and some asynchronous, and the target audience is either our secondary teachers who are not involved in letters and then those elementary teachers who are not directly involved in letters. 
So professional learning days. Um, professional learning days are designed to enhance instructional practices through engaging sessions that will provide choice and a collaborative culture with a focus on interactions between teachers, students, and content. The goal is for instructional staff to have the opportunity to attend at least one of the professional learning days, but staff can attend more than one if they would like. They also can attend a full day or even a half day. So if they have obligations back at their school, they can take care of those as well as attend sessions in the afternoon if they want to. The selection of the professional learning days by staff or by schools should enhance and support the overall professional learning plan of the school. So I talked about the professional learning plan for the school at the beginning. So whatever we are selecting on these days should enhance the plan for the school or your individual PDP as a teacher. Some staff may engage in letters professional learning on one or more of these days. We do have, these are some of, some of our professional learning days are scheduled days for letters for some of our schools. The letters professional learning takes precedent and professional learning days are optional for staff that are doing letters, but they're still open if they're available and would like to participate. To provide schools, all schools access to content, the same sessions are offered on all three days. So no matter which day your school interacts with for the PL days, you're able to get the same content as any other staff member that's in Wake County. Principals direct staff as to which day or days they should choose sessions based on their calendar. And these are obviously scheduled on teacher work days for each of the calendars. Um, sessions that are being offered on professional learning days, there are face-to-face -face sessions, there are synchronous sessions and asynchronous sessions. And just to give you a snapshot of some data um, around what we offered, we have approximately 80 different courses. There's about 50 in-person, 13 synchronous, and 19 asynchronous. And staff can go to, all the sessions are not a full day, so some of them are just 90 minutes, so you could go to multiple sessions throughout the day. Um, as Drew shared, we did have our first PL day on Friday, which was a success. Um, still entering attendance and getting surveyed data, but y'all know that that's one of the things that we like to bring to y'all to be able to share as we move throughout the year, so we'll be um, looking forward to doing that. And the last structure that I'll have to share with you is school leadership meetings. So school leadership meetings are specifically for our principals, and we have bi-monthly meetings, and this is protected time for our principals to learn and collaborate with their colleagues. Uh, we are offering some uh, meetings in person this year and some meetings virtual this year. That's based off of principal feedback. Um, there's content-driven grouping, and you might be like, what does that mean? So depending on the content that we're covering with our principals, it may be um, appropriate to present to them whole group, or it may be appropriate for us to group them by level or by area, um, or they may even be in their principal PLC, which is it's their area, but their level. So um, I was in the southern area, middle school principal PLC, if, if that kind of gives you an example. Um, so depending on the content, we would group them throughout the day based on just to meet their learning needs and to be able to collaborate appropriately based on the content. And then the last thing is around support hours. So we offer support hours for principals, and these are also open to assistant principals. They're virtual. So all the department leads up in central services and kind of content experts are available in Google Meets um, for a window of time, and they're just in there to ask, to answer questions or provide support if principals or APs need it. And that is something that we started as a result of the pandemic, um, but has been really successful for them to be able to have that set time to easily act access people up here to help them think through problems or problem solve um, or point them in the right, the right direction if they have any questions. Thank you all for letting me share the six structures and I'll turn it back over to Drew. Thanks, Emily. So I, I mentioned earlier, we just wanted to close with a kind of a quick forecast or preview of some topics that have been identified that um, probably fall on that slide that you saw earlier um, that we've identified in terms of district priorities. Um, and areas of focus, especially going into the, the beginning of the new school year this fall. Um, and as always, I'll just say the caveat, of course, is these are subject to change, and um, it may be even be, I think even with the school mental health improvement plan, it may be that some of these get moved up to an earlier work session. Um, so I, we can just, obviously, we just wanted to let you know that these are topics that uh, in consultation, at least
least with this committee, with Ms. Scott, Ms. Uh, Johnson Hostler, the superintendent, Dr. McFarland, that we've begun to identify uh, in terms of staff work. But as always, um, we'll adjust course as needed and we'll move something up um, to expedite it if necessary. Um, but some of these topics include, I mentioned school mental health improvement plan, that, that may be one that gets moved up. Um, we also talked about um, a K-12 math update uh, and also some preliminary 21-22 data review. I think uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of a, an overview, I think it's usually the first week in October that the state board certifies uh, previous year EOG, EOC, grad rate data. Uh, you know, we'll be able to share a little bit of some unofficial preliminary data specific to math in September, but we do want to talk about some of the updates that are happening, um, you know, as we certainly continue to hear feedback. Um, we know that you continue to hear feedback um, and, and comments and some concerns. We want to do our best uh, coming up in September to address some of those uh, specifically and directly. Um, and then moving into October, uh, we anticipate sharing with you an update I mentioned earlier. Uh, an overview of the this past summer's extended learning program, uh, both in terms of data around participation and performance. Uh, but we also probably will provide a little bit of a preview of what may be coming in the, 20, the summer of 2023 as well. Um, I think also in October, tentatively, we've got slated district management group part one, uh, the, the uh, review of special education services work that's ongoing there. Uh, and then in October, uh, we plan to have at least one, and this may be another one that, that bleeds into a second or even a third update, one comprehensive data review that includes state testing data, grad rates, um, and other policy 3420, which is on promotion and retention requirements um, that we'll be sharing with the board um, via this committee in October. And then in November, kind of continuing uh, with that theme, we'll be providing you an update on the curriculum implementation study around EL, OUR, and MVP that our data resources and accountability, or data research and accountability office has been engaged in the last couple of years. Um, I believe they're in the final stages of making some adjustments and updates uh, to that to have it ready by that time. And then in that same meeting, after we share the, kind of the, the overview and the study of what the data is telling us of the long-term implementation uh, in those areas, we also want to take that opportunity to share some new work um, and maybe some renewed work, for lack of a better description, around curriculum procurement implementation and evaluation work. Um, and that will really be, I think, a, a deeper look at a framework for longer-term multi-year plans for how and when and what we procure in terms of curriculum and instructional resources in the district. Um, and so we, we are excited to be able, uh, by that point, to provide an, a, a deeper look at what that looks like. And we also felt like, um, you know, over time, we, almost every meeting when we're here, we talk at one point in time about Title I. Even today, it was around family engagement. And so in consultation with uh, Ms. Scott and others, we felt like that would be a timely topic to go a little bit deeper in, both in terms of how we're allotting to schools, what schools are doing with the additional resources, um, and how we monitor and adjust implementation um, based on data points that, that we all uh, are monitoring and reviewing. So that's a quick preview we wanted to close with just to kind of give everyone um, a look ahead um, in September and beyond. And of course, we're happy to respond to any questions that you may have um, on professional learning or, or anything else. Thank you so much for that and, and for um, for the the presentation. I appreciate all of the information. Um, before I turn it over to my colleagues, I just had a really quick question. Um, how, does the state require a certain number of hours for each teacher um, in terms of professional development? And I know letters is one of those things that is like everyone needs to go through that training, but is there are there specific um, subjects that they are supposed to cover? As sure. Well? So for us to maintain our teaching license, um, you are having to do different professional learning and courses, and you get what we say is CEU. So you're getting credits. So the teachers who are doing letters um, are getting their CEUs for that on top of you know, getting um, the certification for going through the program. And so the re they have a renewal um, window of a couple of years to be able to get enough professional learning, and then they're able to, you know, have their license renewed. And school the PL that happens at the school also receives CEU. So any training or learning that they're doing uh, within, uh, within the system, they're going to be getting their CEUs to be able to renew their license. Thank you for that. That's... Yeah. Um, 
I know schools are, are very helpful for that. North Carolina is a difficult state to update your license if you aren't employed um, in a school yes. district, as I'm aware. And there uh, are some <laughs> um, tights around it where there's some, like, certain courses qualify for certain types of credit. Um, and so, you know, depending on what course you take, you get a certain type of credit. Uh, but they are, and depending on what type of license you have would determine what type of, you know, credits you would need to get. Thank you for that. Yeah. And then um, really quick before I turn it over, um, just wanted to make another plug. I think I mentioned this a few years ago, but the um, teachers observing teachers um, concept as a uh, potential uh, way for teachers to gain um, professional development time. I know that's um, kind of a, a a blue sky sort of thing. Like it'd be, you know, if you're fully staffed, that's something a little bit more easy uh, to implement. But I did just want to toss that out there. Uh, so that, that may be on that topic, and I'm looking over to Michelle. We're probably not quite ready to, to share in too much detail, but I think we'll be bringing more about uh, broadly what I would refer to as the concept of a model school or a model classroom um, to, that I think gets at exactly what you just described, where we can better. Um, in a more systemic way, identify best practices that are happening and open up classrooms and schools for other professionals to be able to observe and learn firsthand. So that, it's a great point and I think one that maybe we'll have more information to share in the months ahead. That's great. I know um, every time I had the opportunity to observe teachers either for like field observations when I was in college and then even um, with several years experience um, under my belt, it, it, you always get something when you go watch someone else like, oh, yeah. You know that that's a that's a great um, thing that I could do. So thank you for that. Thank you for considering that. I look forward to learning more about that. But I will turn it over, Ms. Kushner. I saw your hand. Thank you, Ms. Scott. And, and to your point, I think it is the strength of being a large consolidated district is that we have those opportunities to share our excellent teaching practices with new and and, and all teachers so that we get better and better at educating our kids. Um, and in the earlier presentation, um, Mr. Cook, you mentioned, mentioned Fast Bridge um, for the middle school. And is that something similar to um, letters or could you tell us, I didn't see it on the preview, I was waiting for, um, our, well, because middle school, um, Literacy can't be ignored either because we um, we need to make sure kids are on track to graduate once they get to that ninth grade point. Yes, yeah, a great question. So I think FastBridge is a is a progress monitoring tool. It's essentially kind of an, a, an assessment system that teachers will be able to use to monitor um, the learning of their students in the area of reading. Um, and so uh, while uh, you know th there's not a direct connection necessarily to letters, I think uh, it's it's a tool that can be used to identify literacy needs of students in a really specific way that then, again, ideally speaking, allows the teacher or interventionists or others in the building to go in and provide additional supports and instruction if, for example, a student didn't get or didn't master a concept the first time around. So it's really um, geared to, prog to monitor progress, to assess learning in a kind of rolling, real-time way. Um, and it's it's much more formative in nature than it is summative. I see. And then once we identify it, I hope we're, that part two comes where they'll they'll have the resources or intervention and, and ha enrichment that they need to to fill those gaps. That, that's that the goal. Far. Yes, ma'am. Um, and I, I appreciate seeing the um, the blue the slide two and three repeatedly because I think it does remind us there's no magic bullet. There's no magic wand around um, you know, recovering from the last two years. So I appreciate that it's complex work and I appreciate the many layers that you're presenting to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Ms. Carter. All right, thank you for these updates. And I particularly want to thank you for, you did mention again, the work you've done around the IAs with the letters, because I know we had talked about that before. And also just wanted to thank you for the flexibility, because you mentioned in particular on the professional learning days, offering the face-to-face -face synchronous and asynchronous, because I think, um, or at least from my prior experience and from what I've heard from others, sometimes a barrier to signing up for more professional learning is how can I make this work in my life? So I think anything we can do to make it more accessible um, and folks be, no matter what they have to do outside of school hours or even if it's you know on the early release day, it's just 
a lot. Um, the, the question I had was about, um, I know a lot of this goes around for like school staff. Is there any opportunity? I know bus drivers have different um, schedules and whatnot, um, but I know we have taught when was this? I had a work session, I believe, about giving more support uh, for bus drivers um, in particular. So I didn't know if there has been any work done um, to include them more. I know they did some, particularly a lot was done when March 13th of 2020, there were a lot of things put in place, but just trying to see if anything in particular for them as well. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Um, Obviously, with it being student achievement, I didn't highlight the sort of not, I call it the non-instructional side of things. Um, but our, our office does, the Office of Professional Learning does partner with transportation um, around their PL. Most of their PL is housed in an asynchronous way in Learning Central, um, just because for bus drivers, that was the best way for us to be able to meet their needs and the flexibility and the access, all the things that are similar to um, all of us, right, as staff and when we want to learn. Um, but we did partner with them at the beginning of the pandemic, um, trying to get them, you know, to increase their PL offers. But that has been an ongoing um, partnership. And some of the trainings, I mean, once the great thing is, once the trainings are created, as new people are come on, they're able to access those. So it really is um, time well spent when you create a great course that can be there and then so as we roll in new staff which bus drivers are included in that right they're able to engage in that PL yeah and I'll just add real quick Ms. Carter I think it's worth pointing out that I think to that point um, one of the, the the subtle but I think impactful organizational changes that were made uh, when Superintendent Moore came in was to place the Office of Professional Learning under the Chief of Staff's office for the express purpose of doing what Emily just described which is remembering that professional learning is all encompassing and it's as much as we in academics like to hog Emily and her team and probably monopolize their time, it really does go well beyond um, academic advancement. And so I think um, whether we're talking about transportation and the operational side or academics, um, her office is involved in every aspect of, of the work in the district. And thank you, thank you for saying that, Mr. Cook, because that is, um what we hope, I think Superintendent Moore has said this before, that we hope that every employee of the Wake County Public School System, regardless of their job, realizes that they impact our students as well, that their work in some way absolutely impacts our students. So thank you for, for pointing out that, that change. Um, do we have any other questions or feedback? Well, this, um, this has been a great uh, update. I also appreciate the um, the information that we'll be talking about at our next uh, few meetings. And thank you for all of the information um, and for all that you do. And again, thank you to our staff who um, make our Student Achievement Committee meetings possible. Um, so with that, I think we're gonna go ahead and close out our meeting. Just wanted to point out that our next uh, Student Achievement Committee meetings are scheduled for September 26th, October 24th and November 28th, and then of course the month of December usually uh, does not have a student achievement meeting. And with that, we will go ahead and adjourn this meeting early at 4.30 p.m. So thank you again to everyone for being here today for your great questions and feedback, and of course to our staff for presenting us with this information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.